you wrote an article about uh, stages of community development. Uh, uh, what's your opinion opinion about local community? Here? Yeah. yeah. So I've actually, uh, this is my second Def, uh, DEF GAM, and uh, it feels like the community has grown a lot in the last year. Um, there's always been a development community here, but it always felt relatively internal. So people here know each other, but they don't really reach out a lot to the international community. And I feel like that has gotten much better as well. So Because of the, the language barrier? I mean, the language barrier is obviously a huge problem. Um, but then on top of that, like they're also just it, that is something that slowly grows, and as more people become connected with the rest of the industry, they introduce new contacts, new abilities, new, new opportunities to their local community. It feels like that's happening right now. Um, so I think it's a really exciting moment to be here in the local area. Okay, and uh, did you see uh, similar to our communities in other countries? What are the yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of countries that are sort of in, in this stage, like sort of a, a early international community. Uh, you see those all around the world. You see them in you see them in uh, large parts of southern and eastern Europe. You see them in uh, the Middle East, in Northern Africa, in South America, uh, in large parts of Asia. Um, really, like the countries that are traditionally English speaking are the ones that have benefited the most from how the games industry works right now. Yeah. Um, but like things are catching up, and that's good news, I think. So, yeah, no, this is, I actually think the growth of this community is far ahead of those of, of many other communities around the world. That's so, uh, so, Game Dev World is uh, what is Game Dev World exactly? Can you please describe it? So Game Dev World is going to be an international resource for knowledge about game development. So think of it as a library of the best writing and the best videos and the best podcasts about game development. Um, and all of that content is uh, collected in one place on Game Dev World. And most of that content is going to be in English. Now the thing that we're going to do with Game Dev World is we're going to take that information and translate it to every major language in the world. So it's going to be available not just in English, we're going to make sure it's available in Spanish, in Portuguese, in Russian, in uh, Chinese and in Arabic to start. And then as we grow we're going to introduce more languages. But it makes all of this knowledge that is traditionally really only accessible to English speaking people available to everybody around the world. Okay, so how can our community take part in it? Maybe we can uh contribute some articles or do a translation work? Yeah, so for now the first so the first um, round of articles, the first round of content is professionally translated uh, with help of local uh, developers. So a lot of the games industry has a lot of jargon, a lot of language that isn't like very common. So the average translator won't be able to translate it well. Um, but we're going to make sure that the text is translated well and then run it past developers, figure out where we need to make changes. Um, and then after Game Dev World is launched, we're going to make it slightly more community focused. So we're going to ask the developers in local communities to help out with translating, to help out figuring out what kind of articles they need. So, for example, here articles about working with publishers will be really welcome. That's like a question I got a lot today here at the event. It's like, how do you work with publishers? How do you know whether something is a good deal? So, for example, people here could say, hey, we need more articles and publishers. And then at Game, Dev, at Game Dev World, we could look up good articles about that, offer those for translation. The community can translate those and add them to the Russian part of the, the website. Um, so that's kind of the idea. We're starting with like highly curated articles, so chosen by industry professionals and experts and veterans. And then as we go, we move it more towards a community project. So we're at step one now. Okay, so we have a couple of articles to show you, maybe. That sounds good. Okay, so let's switch the topic a bit. Uh, is it possible to use uh, early access and uh, open uh, development uh, approach to non-content heavy games such as Nuclear Throne? Yeah, I think er so. I think early access is a very specific thing. It's not just something you can use for any game out there. There's games that have very high replayability are great on early access. Games that have uh, large multiplayer player aspects to them are uh, very good for early access. Uh, but like a linear story game, for example, probably not a good fit for early access. So it kind of depends on the game that you're making, but 
open development and early access are very much the same thing in many ways. It's like opening up your development process to other people, allowing people to give feedback uh, while you're developing. So I feel that um, if your game if your game is appropriate for early access, it's a, it's a great way of making a video game. I just feel that it shouldn't be considered a default, right? Because like I would hate to have I would hate to play a Gone Home that was an early access, <laughs> With right? Bucks, the um, bits of story. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's it depends on the game. Okay, so uh, what are the uh, alternative ways maybe for story driven games? For so for story driven games, I think a large part of it should be on the on the performances or the writing. Uh, I think a large part of of doing that is creating enough backstory and maybe talking about backstory of the game or maybe talking about uh, backstory of characters or backstories of the world, stuff like that, and allowing people to sort of be part of that. I think you, it's harder to create a dialogue about what is effectively a monologue. If you're trying to tell, tell a story uh, in a video game, you're using video games in a really specific way uh, that doesn't necessarily... That isn't necessarily more video gamey than it is more towards a book or a theater no, play. No, game is not a book. Yeah, but Definitely. like that doesn't make it not a game. Um, but it means that if you move closer to say theater, where the story is defined, then uh, you obviously have less space to play with open development because you're you're making a story. Oh well, yeah, yeah. Twin um, games also are games, but uh, specific games. Yeah, they're very specific games. So if you want to make a game. And you want to do uh, open if you want to do something else in open development, you have to play with those things instead of the open development, which plays with the interaction of the game, which is only useful if the interaction is the core thing. Okay, okay. And uh, how to find audience uh, at the end of the early access development stage? I mean, I think you should be asking the the opposite question: how to get audience at the start <laughs> oh, yeah. of the early access Maybe stage. Maybe you can tell us. Um, The thing we did is when we launched the game, we made as much noise as possible. We reached out to the press, we reached out to YouTubers, and it actually turned out that the press wasn't that interested, but the YouTube community was really, really welcoming of the game because they had something new to play, um, and they got the promise that every week they would get an update, so they knew that they could create a lot of content about the game. And YouTube and Twitch have actually been the largest part of our marketing, and that is the way we found most of our audience. And the interesting thing about early access is a lot of it is community building. So a lot of it is make sure that if you do updates, you do them on a weekly basis or bi-weekly basis. But that there's a schedule, you know, that's people come back to look for more. And while they're waiting for more, they talk about it and they discuss with you and they give feedback. And that way, very slowly, not quickly, very, very slowly, your game starts to earn a little bit more and a little bit more because there's more and more people that hear about it. And then when there's more people that hear about it, there's more people that talk about it, so there's more people that hear it's about like it. It's like an avalanche. So you need to build. But like the trick with that is it goes really, really slowly. For the first six months, Nuclear Throne earned almost nothing. Like it earned a little bit, but not much. Then after six months, suddenly it started moving. And then it started moving faster and faster and faster. So like part of that is just not giving up. And part of that is like listening to your community. Like not always... But like, at least acknowledge, like let them know that you are reading their stuff, you know, answer, like answer forum posts, talk to people, uh, go to Twitch channels, go to YouTube, but be part of the community around your game. And that way you can build an audience. Okay, okay. This was very insightful. Thank you, Rami. Thanks so much. much.